So Dudu, we welcome your introduction now. Well, thank you so much, Gretchen. It's so true when you say I've known them for such a long time. I've known them when they were, Jeremy was still a young activist, very young, and uh, Nozizo was in and out of prison and in solitary confinement and everything. So it's such a privilege for me to be able to introduce these two friends from my yearly meeting, Central and Southern Africa yearly meeting. And friends that I have known and admired their choices in life. You know, the life they chose and they live is so exemplary and, uh, and true to who they are. I hope I can do justice. Nozizwe's ministry, incidentally, Nozizwe means a lady of nations. The calling and the way she's lived her life, to me, she lived as probably the grannies who named her knew that she was not going to belong to some small place in KZN, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. She was going to be, she was go, going to carry a message into the world. She's done this in many platforms. She has served as guest lecturer at Haverford College as part of the Friends in Residence program by, hosted by Quaker Affairs Office. She has contributed immensely to the health, social welfare of women, especially in South Africa, in the various roles that she has, she has participated in in government through leadership and standing for the citizens of her country, especially those that don't have a word, that, you know, the, that that have no voice, no Zizu has been able to be the voice. When she was in parliament, when she left parliament after serving there for 15 years and in various capacities that, where she was challenged by her own colleagues and everybody else, but she stood firm for the truth and her belief that you know, people deserve much more, especially women who sometimes through cultural practices, they end up being oppressed and, and uh, violated in many ways. When she left, after, left government after 15 years, he and Jeremy, she and Jeremy established an, an NGO, non-governmental organization, embrace dignity for women's human rights, campaigning for the abolition of the system of prostitution. Embrace dignity strives for the realization of gender equality by challenging patriarchal, cultural and gender norms that we've grown to accept and take as normal. And um, Jeremy, on the other hand, has been a, an activist since I've known her and stood outside Westville prison. And what I admired most about Jeremy was he was such a soft and gentle activist. Unlike some that, you know, you hear more noise than actual action. So he was supporting conscientious objectors and uh, detainees and the end conscription campaign. He had a career in industry, engineering, teaching, but what I like most, her life is what actually taught. He spoke more than the words and himself standing before a class or whatever. Nozizwe and Jeremy, 
belong to our yearly meeting, Central and Southern Africa yearly meeting, and their meeting is the Western Cave, which is part of a Central and Southern Africa yearly meeting. No Z's were in sharing her message. She has delivered the Richard Gash lecture with a very apt title, Speaking Truth to Power. Peace is a struggle in 2006. Because sometimes it's easy to speak truth in corners, but speaking it to power and knowing how vulnerable you can be by taking that stance. But Nozizo was enabled and empowered to do so, and indeed she did. She also delivered, the, she's supposed to deliver, she was invited by Britain Yearly Meeting to deliver the Salter Lecture in 2020, which of course has been postponed due to the COVID-19 that you are faced with, postponed to 2021. And Jeremy, in his activism, also in, was involved in the peace, the Quaker Peace Networks in Africa, where she's been to, he's been to Burundi and is a facilitator for alternatives to violence, trying truly to live out the peace testimony that we carry. We can say we're peaceful people, but what he has done and goes out to do to empower people to discover that sometimes we can be part of the violence which is deeply embedded in us uh we have the good fortune of and uh, i would like friends to give you nozizwe and jeremy madlala routledge and i hope we'll be able to receive what god has put in them and to say to them, the prayer that we opened with, we did not choose you, no Zizwe and Jeremy. God chose you to be a vessel to bring this message to us and inspire us to go out in the world and be his hands and feet. Thank you, friends. We'll have a bit of silence and no Zizwe and Jeremy will speak out of the silence when they are ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to do for that uh, introduction. Also, thank you, Gretchen, for your wonderful hosting of, of these conversations. I'm, I'm learning a lot from you. And I will be speaking slowly because I do have an accent, <laughs> a Zulu accent. We are going to speak um, hopefully for 15 minutes and we really look forward to a conversation because this is what this is. It's a conversation among us. I will speak first and then Jeremy will come after me. We want to thank you, friends, for joining us. We are aware that some of you had to wake up very early and others are staying up late on a Saturday. And this shows your commitment. We really appreciate that. And we want to thank FWCC for organizing these conversations. It is indeed a great honor to be invited and to speak on behalf of the Africa section. And we're looking forward to engaging with our Quakers from the different strands of Quakerism because Jeremy had the opportunity to engage with Quakers from Kenya, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, and the DRC through the Quaker Peace Network Africa and AVP. We honor the work being undertaken by our friends in Africa, especially as we need the peace on our continent. You know, um, Gretchen, you said things will change and we will be able to meet again physically after we have overcome this pandemic. 
And I believe that. I believe it because there was a time when we didn't know that apartheid was going to end, and it did end. And it took work, international work, for apartheid to end. And I'm reminded of Hugh Masigela when he sang, Hugh Masigela, who many of you know, sang a song raising the issue about dictators in Africa. And he said, everything must change and everything will change. Nothing is forever. So I do believe we will overcome the pandemic that we face at this challenging time as we seek ways to stop the devastating virus. We need to draw from the collective wisdom that has helped us in confronting other crises that we have faced. It is for this reason that we are going to share with you our experience of being in the national liberation movement that ended apartheid. And we believe that this, we can draw parallels between that struggle in South Africa, as well as other struggles around the world in building a social revolution to end what we are now faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. As part of the National Liberation Movement, we learned the importance of organizing broad-based support and making people aware of their, their power. People had to believe that change was going to happen. Musicians, poets, and writers composed songs, poems, and plays about freedom. Gosisigeleli Africa, God Bless Africa, became the struggle anthem. We chanted victory in our lifetime and we said, Amandla, all power to the people. We organized our own newspapers, books and pamphlets to counteract state propaganda and censorship. We organized against inferior education and formed the People's Health Movement. Workers formed trade unions and organized strikes. University-based academics provided expert advice and support to social labor and political movements. Churches came together in organizations like Diaconia and the South African Council of Churches and were inspired by liberation theology from Central and South, South, um, Southern America. They organized a significant interfaith resistance. Progressive lawyers and doctors formed alternative professional bodies and supported detainees and nest the wounds of people beaten by police dogs or healed those injured in state-sponsored violence. Progressive young white men refused to be conscripted and became conscientious object objectors. Women organized and demanded their issues to be included on the national liberation agenda. We said, a nation is not free unless women are free. The opposition to apartheid went global and the anti-apartheid movement organized boycotts, boycott of South African goods and mobilized a powerful disinvestment campaign. While a new chapter in South Africa, in South African political history was opened on 27 April, 1994, which ushered in Mandela as our first black president. We soon realized that fighting for freedom is not a once-off event, but a constant struggle. Today's social movements in South Africa build on that rich history. The people's campaigns for access to land, decent housing, healthcare, or quality education are a reminder that struggle continues. The voices of protest continue to rise through the people's movements. In 2001, the Treatment Action Campaign partnered with the government at a time when the multinational corporations were meant to be invincible and pressured pharmaceutical companies uh, from taking court action to stop us importing cheaper gener generic medicines. The TAC played a pivotal role in a campaign to win access to ARVs for people infected with HIV and AIDS and took our government to, to the Constitutional Court to compel it to provide nevirapine to stop mother-to-child transmission of the virus. 
These struggles illustrate the power of building alliances outside and inside structures of power. Their victory illustrates the importance of collective action. In the face of the COVID pandemic, public voices are rising, calling for a people's vaccine. People are demanding information on exact plans to make the vaccines av available and the rollout plan. Whether it is around developing vaccines or developing healthcare, the pandemic has reminded us of the importance of cooperation instead of competition. The pandemic has highlighted socioeconomic inequalities. And to show this, I want to read a quotation from Abatla Libasem Jondol, Shek Dwellers Association, which I saw the other day. It says, and I quote, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, we as the poor and marginalized in the townships, rural areas and urban shaped settlements have been concerned that once the virus is spread in our areas, it will hit us worst. The statement continues. During this pandemic, we in the shacks of indignity continue to suffer and die while the political elite and their families live in luxury. We share dirty and dangerous public toilets with more than 2,000 people. We spend hours in queues for water. We burn when there is fire. We are washed away during tropical storms. This has become our daily life. We have no access to roads for emergency services to use. This is particularly important now in South Africa as the healthcare system struggles and ambulance have, ambulances have to wait to, for the patients to get a bed in our, in our hospitals. So as we look at our responses, we should look also at the unequal impact on people, especially those living on the margins. Our response to the pandemic must take these issues into account as we seek to build better with a democratic dividend for all our citizens. We must demand public leadership and policies that embrace the values of the greater common good and as Quakers, we have a rich history of responding to global crises. Our Quaker testimonies have guided our action. Quakers value partnership and coalition building, which Jeremy will be talking about just now. As a focus for this conversation, I've picked two issues that I think I would die for. Mm -hmm. Peace in Africa and ending poverty. In 2000, and in response to my appointment as Deputy Minister of Defense, our Southern Africa yearly meeting engaged in a creative Quaker process, and the result was a Quaker statement on peace in Africa. The Quaker statement says, and I quote, peace is not brought about by preparation for war. Peace is achieved by ensuring democracy, good governance and justice, and upholding the rule of law and human rights. It is achieved by addressing the basic needs of people, such as provision of adequate health care, fighting the scourge of HIV and AIDS, eliminating inequality and poverty, and providing education, including early childhood education, adult literacy, and peace education." End of quote. Although the Quaker statement has influenced our actions individually and collectively, we did not actively pursue and evaluate its impact on government policy. We can still do that. It remains a valuable document if we regard it as a living document and can engage with some areas in which it could be developed. The Quaker statement also said, we commit ourselves and all our citizens and governments to work towards the abolition of war in Africa, build peace by non-military means demilitarize and reduce expenditure on arms, convert arms industries to socially useful production, and in the interim to ensure transparent and accurate reporting of all subsidies, direct and indirect to the arms industry and related activities, unquote. We also said, consider voluntary or national youth non-military service as a means of building peace and development. Consider state funded, institutes for peace to research non-military means to ensure the security of the state against the strategic threats, as well as research the experience in peacemaking that has been developed on the African continent. 
Now thinking about this and in relation to a collective response, and in particular in relation to expenditure on arms, I'm reminded of a statement by President Dwight Eisenhower in March 1953, after the death of Joseph, Joseph Stalin, and as part of drawing attention to the Cold War era arms race. And this is a popular statement that he made. He said, he said every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. The quote carries on, and I will share it in the, in the chat. But as I move towards uh, ending my part, I just want to speak in empathy, as we all feel the pain of loss, I personally have lost some friends and some family in this pandemic. And it is easy to lose hope. But I say, let us, let us draw inspiration from the many successful struggles we have waged. Our individual and collective action will defeat the virus and other crises that we face. As I finish, I wish to conclude by drawing on the wisdom in the call by Dr. Harold Weaver of the Black Quaker Project in the pamphlet, Racist Systemic Violence and Retrospective Justice, an African-American Quaker scholar activist challenges conventional narratives. That's the title of the pamphlet. His call to friends in this pamphlet is to look at societal problems through new lenses. Is calling on us to confront systemic violence with anti violence, acknowledging institutional and systemic racism rather than merely individual racism, considering a retrospective justice program that compensates for and helps remove the historical inequalities related to the transatlantic slave trade, chattel slavery, and their legacies. I would add apartheid as we look at this and the change that needs to happen. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Nosy. Um, I'll continue now. Um, and I want to look at um, our Quaker community as a complex adaptive system that right from the very beginning um, had this characteristic in that it um, didn't have a hierarchical structure. Uh, it was uh, included women and men in ministry, and um, they lit the world and m made significant changes. And the whole history uh, of Quakers has many examples. Now, um, there's been research on complex adaptive systems that are different from systems that are hierarchical and command and control systems. In other words, they trust the people in the system uh, to find their own light and uh, take things forward, rather than saying, this is what you need to do. This is needed for some things, like it, for the COVID, it's good to say, wear your face mask, um, wash your hands, um, keep your distance. That's important, but it only works when everybody takes that on themselves and does it. You can't actually force everybody to do that. People need to understand it and do it themselves. And that's more like the way Quakers work. Um, I want to just show a video showing how, uh, showing a, a complex assessment adaptive system in the in the natural world and i hope i can show it um Nosy, can you show he's going to set it up but while i'm talking i'll just talk about what some of these characteristics are first of all um individual agents have freedom to act in unpredictable ways we all know from our quaker meetings uh how people act and surprise us uh, 
and adaptable elements can change themselves. Uh, individuals can change. Um, if we think of the COVID virus, that's an adaptive system. The my, my virus mutates and, um, and um, develops more virulent um, forms. forms that uh, then uh, create it to go on. So there's a complex, we have to uh, compete with that system that is attacking us. Can you just share the screen now, Nosy, and we will um, look at it. I think about that, um, they show characteristics. Each bird is uh, an agent in that. And when they, uh, they have, there's a small set of simple rules. They mustn't bump into each other. They must follow uh, the direction of the person next to them and move towards the center of the flock. But sometimes some of the birds deviate from that and that causes the whole cloud to move. But if you were to think about what the purpose of that was, I would think that they are enjoying themselves. I can think of nothing else. It's quite amazing. So there's a purpose, and that's a characteristic of complex adaptive systems. And so we need to think about what our purpose is. Uh, Nosy mentioned she would die for peace in Africa, uh, but there are other purposes that people might have and for the whole world. But um, I would like to just share some simple rules that characterize complex adaptive systems. The individuals have freedom to act, often in unpredictable ways. Adaptable elements can change themselves, even the COVID virus, I mentioned that. And there's a small set of simple rules. It's not a complicated system, like the birds flocking. Uh, and Quakers have simple rules, sitting in silence and discerning the way forward. And that keeps us on track. Um, there's a poster, famous Quaker poster, um, about the fable of the two mules. Um, that, and it says, cooperation is better than conflict, or I would say also than competition. We need an economic system that is a cooperative one, not a competitive one, which creates uh, extreme divisions between rich and poor. Uh, Non-linearity. Small efforts can create large effects, and large effects can be quite ineffective sometimes. I think of 10 Quakers who met in London with the intention of abolishing slavery. Uh, that would have been unimaginable at the time, but it eventually happened. Emergent behavior or not, no, novel behavior occurs. Um, and so we just think of Quakers who respond to a call from Greenhaven Prison in New York and the alternatives to project, a violence project arose from that and is spread around the world. Um, these systems are not, not predictable in detail. It's like the weather. But the only way is to create the conditions which allow the thing to 
happen like a farmer. He can't control everything. He just makes everything possible so that it can happen. But he can't predict how the harvest will be. There's inherent order. If you think of bees or termites or forests, they um, grow or sustain themselves uh, and have great order, but there's no person in charge of the forest if you leave it up to nature or in charge of the beehive. The queen doesn't instruct all the bees what to do. Um, there's a context and a bed is, in, is important. Quakers exist in the world and that affects us and we affect them. Change. Um, Quakers evolved and ha we have different strands of Quakers now. And I think it's much better to, to look at them as evolutions rather than divisions. And that's why FWCC is so important in creating this conversation. Um, and it's good to look at things from a biological perspective. Uh, I mentioned that about the farmers. Um, so I've got some questions that Quakers can ask themselves. What is the good enough five-year vision of our Quaker community in Africa, remembering that we'll be hosting the FWCC gathering in Durban in 2024? In other words, we don't need the best plan. We just need to have a, a good enough plan, and we learn as we go along. And um, I think Zoom has created such a great opportunity for Quakers to be much more adaptive uh, and, uh, and this uh, meeting now is an example of that. What simple rules are important to guide this process and how can we create space for new ideas and innovation? And I think Quakers are very good at providing these sort of spaces. I remember going to London with Noziswa um, for a workshop at a um, friend's house um, addressing the issue of um, are there alternatives to war uh, after the conflict in Kosovo? Um, and people always say, well, but what are we going actually doing about it? And out of that came the pa Quaker Peace Network, which then, because there were more wars in Africa than any con other continent, uh, decided to focus in Africa. And I think um, with the Quaker Statement on Peace in Africa and the Quaker Peace Network, we can look at taking things forward. I just want to end with uh, three quotes. One is by Amanda, Amanda Gorman, her, poet, her poem at the Biden's uh, inauguration. When the day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it, if only are, we are brave enough to be it. And then a quote on truth. Truth can be spoken only by someone who already lives inside it, not by someone who, will, who still lives in untruth and only sometimes reaches out from untruth towards it. That was the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And the other one is William Blake. And we are put on earth for a little while that we may learn to hear the beams of love, to bear the beams of love. That's William Blake. So perhaps those three rules of light, looking at the light, uh, seeking the truth, and um, and practicing love are some simple rules that Quakers can use. Thank you. Thank you both. Wow, I'm so humbled by both your presence and all that you've shared. It's very, very rich. And I'm sure we have lots of questions and lots of things we want to talk with you about. Um, I'm going to not do the next uh, breakout room only because uh, we just have, you know, about 35 minutes to have conversation. 
So I'm gonna open up the floor and ask people to raise your hand using the participants list. But I'm going to ask uh, John Lampin, uh, would you and Diana, you have a question in the chat. Would you articulate that and let's just begin there. Okay, let's just say hi to Jeremy and there's these because we know you well. Hi friends. <laughs> Our question is, in times of struggle, we experience hope, despair, vision and uncertainty, effort, exhaustion, anger, pity. And that's true in the COVID pandemic too. Can you say something about your experiences in moving between these states of mind? It's a tough question. I would say it's normal for us to feel uh, these uh, very real feelings of sometimes feeling hopeless or in despair. What does matter though is for us to be able to get ourselves out of those states and to move forward. And gatherings such as this, you know, talking with one another. In the struggle, for example, we found that when we lost hope, it helped to meet others who were enthusiastic, who were singing, who were shouting slogans saying victory in our lifetime. So we need one another. Every struggle, every issue we face calls on us to be connected, even though right now we're physically separated. Mm. And we were fortunate in that we were locked down together and um, in a wonderful place, Haverford, uh, with a wonderful nature trail. So we uh, got to know the forest uh, very much better but um it not everyone is fortunate and we were thinking about people like that quote nosy was saying about people living in the townships here where that you are sharing a, a room with uh, five or six people you can't get out and sharing the toilet so um and COVID gave rise to a greater awareness of the inequalities, I think. And uh, it would be a great pity if we um, cure everybody with the, the uh, vaccine and forget about these inequalities. We need to actually look very seriously at how the economic system works and how it can be more equal. Mm. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I see a question from Joe Matthews, then we'll take one from Anod, and then Betsy Kasdan after, after Anod. Joe? Hi, um, thank you ever so much for speaking to us today. Um, my question is around, um, Having grown up in South Africa during the transformation, it has been very much part of my formative experience as a person. And I, I wondered if you could say more for everyone about the process of cultivating the rainbow nation from both your lived experiences within the anti-apartheid struggle, as well as into the transformational government that actually brought people who are very much divided, as we see in the US today, across a bridge into the new South Africa. I think there's something really uh, rich in how that happened, that perhaps you both have much wisdom to, to share to the rest of us. Thank you. Just very quickly, and without leaving everything to one person, we were fortunate to have a leader with a vision who led us and made us believe that change was possible in Nelson Mandela. Uh, we also had Desmond Tutu, Father Desmond Tutu, and that whole process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was very important in bringing us together. Unfortunately, that work has not been followed through to the extent that it should have. And now we see a situation where leaders are not afraid to steal money from the poor. So we are challenged, but indeed we were very excited about the change 
and South Africans really came out in their numbers, as you remember, to vote for change. You know, we still remember those long queues. But of course, right now we see people getting a bit more discouraged because of the slowness of change, but also of the corruption. One encouraging thing I think that helped is our constitution because in the last week or so, uh, it's been going along a long time, the uh, uh, Zondor Commission into State Capture is uh, playing on television uh, on the three channels most of the time. Uh, and we're just hearing cases of um, corruption uh, facilitated sometimes with the knowledge of our previous president. Um, and but so bad things have happened and that's a real problem but fortunately it seems but we never can be sure about this that uh, these things are going to be addressed and the re release of that report will be really significant thank you for that thank you for that question joe it's 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 often a change can be quite fragile can't it and uh, we have to keep at it, don't we? Let's hear from um, Anand. I think you're calling from Nairobi. Yeah, thank you, Gretchen. And uh, Saobona, uh, Nazizwe, and Jeremy. It's a long time, even if it's Zoom. It's nice yeah. to see you. I think you, you may have already touched on this um, in the previous answers. Um, but um, in terms of what I see in Kenya, it feels so much more like apartheid, but the economic apartheid. And, um, and you've already touched on the need, need for good leaders, but in some ways it feels like COVID has revealed um, uh, so much about that injustice and the inequality um, and, and also just huge denial of reality. Like here we, we're having political rallies ongoing. Uh, Tanzania is even worse regarding COVID. I wonder if you can say something about that and um, yeah. It's a difficult one. I think leadership uh, is important. I just saw on uh, in Twitter or Facebook, uh, Angela Merkel has just stepped down and uh, people in par the parliament stood and clapped for uh, six minutes and people in the street just celebrated what she done. And she came from East Germany and she was in power for about 16 years and she still lives in the same flat. She and her husband uh, do all the housework. And it's really quite an amazing example. And uh, she just went about her business and now she stepped down. So leadership is very important, uh, but uh, I don't really know the answer to your question. It's, very, it's a very important question. And perhaps that's one we need to take forward as Quakers, the issue of inequality. I, I know there's, been quite a lot of work by Quakers on that. And, and talking about leadership, um, I'm always very much aware of the fact that leadership can come from below. So we mustn't always expect that leadership will only be from above. And when we look recent, at the recent events in uh, the United States of America, where a leader went rope. Uh, the people have come together even though it's been a painful uh, period in the US, but the people have come together and there's hope now. So I always ho have hope in, in, in the people seeking truth. And unfortunately under social media right now, it becomes a challenge finding what is true and what is not true. But as Jeremy quoted from Wittgenstein, I think it's possible for us to gather and use the truth that we know and share that truth with others and in, in the hope that that will um, uh, thrive and we'll be able to bring about true change or the change that um, is more just, more fair. Mm. Very good, thank you. And uh, some of you may know that Nazizwe and Jeremy were in the US for a year while uh, 
our, that leader was in office. So they know of what they speak. <laughs> They've actually lived that as well. Let's hear from Betsy Kasdan, from, also from the US. Thank you. This has been wonderful and it's lovely to see people I know and people I don't yet know. Um, my question is in this vision of a, a complex adaptable system, which I found very helpful, how does such a system deal with disrupt, deliberate disruptors um, in the US and I assume some other places in the world, we have aggressive anti-mask people. We have aggressive refusals to obey uh, closing rules or distancing. Um, and that doesn't even get into things like having the US Capitol and state legislatures invaded by highly organized armed uh, insurgents, which we expect is going to continue to happen. So, and, and many of us in our local meetings have experienced people who just refuse to abide by the simple agreed upon rules. Um, and, and how does one deal with that without using uh, essentially coercive force. <laughs> Tony? I don't know, but I can only think that it helps to, to meet with uh, your friends in the Quaker meeting and take it on as, as an issue. I know it's an issue in the Haverford meeting as well, that question has come <laughs> up. And, um, I think to have hope that uh, truth will prevail, but uh, it's difficult. And I think also about try out different things. Um, try loving them, try ignoring them, whatever. But I don't know. Um, and I, I really think we can just hold you in the light as you wrestle with this problem. And, and for you to, and I'm, I'm sure you know this, but for you to continue to do the right thing. Mm. I, I saw, and I see it here in South Africa, when somebody sees you with your mask on, they, they, they feel uncomfortable, they look in their pockets to find their mask. Yeah. So I think continue to do the right thing. And like those birds flocking, I believe that it will have an impact. Your positive action will have an impact. Mm. Mm. Well, and we also learned in the last Qu uh, two Quaker conversations ago, Nizozwe, how much you have been involved in public health issues. And so, um, you know, you're, I'm sure you're quite aware of all the elements of the pandemic. And um, I, I, all these questions kind of lead me to be thinking about you just, how do you deal with anger? You know, and it's kind of back to John's first question. And how do you keep from being discouraged in light of what feels monumentally challenging? You know, will we ever get to that change? I mean, you've spoken to that, but could, could you say more about, you know, that how do you keep hope alive? Thinking about anger, I often think anger can be positive. Anger can be positive because that is what drives us as individuals to go and commit ourselves to change whatever we see that's going wrong. We do need to transform our anger and use it for the, for the good rather than reacting. It's easy to react violently from anger. But I think to start with as Quakers, we have this process of discernment. You, you do need an, a, an opportunity, a moment to sit with yourselves and ask yourself the question, what is going on and what can I, what can I do to change this? I used to be angry, very angry at the apartheid regime in those years of, of 
deep repression. And fortunately, that anger is what brought me into the movement. So it is possible to actually transform your anger, but that anger is what drove me into the movement. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see a question from Yannicka. Yes, just a small remark. I suppose most of you have read about the uh, very violent riots in the Netherlands, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, where anti-maskers and COVID deniers and also youth gangs invaded the city centers and uh, set, uh, set motor cars alive through uh, looted shops. But just uh, what I would like us to think about is that the authorities did discover that where years ago uh, youth programs had been had had run had been started and were still running, uh, was the local council, local police who cooperated in that. They kept in touch with the young people, spoke to them, made them feel part of society. That those neighborhoods where these youths came from, which used to be such problems, that none of the young men taking part in those riots came from those particular neighborhoods. So, just like to ask Quakers to think about that and see what it tells us. Mm, thank you. I'm a great believer in the Alternatives to Violence Project. And, um, and I think there's an opportunity with the Zoom. Uh, two of the inmates from Polesmoor Prison are now doing an online basic advanced and training facilitators course with um, Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. And um, they've already run one of these courses. And I think it's a great opportunity for Quakers to take this. And um, many Quakers are ABP facilitators. I know none of this, uh, and to uh, uh, look and learn from them. And so I'm thinking of asking them to train a group of uh, uh, Quakers uh, in the seat. They have a group of 25. So we'll, we'll look at this and I'll get in touch with you as well, uh, Yannicka. And thank you, Yannicka. Thanks for joining us today. We are so happy to see you, especially after your recent uh, illness. Um, the issue about violence and impatience often arises out of people feeling those in leadership are not listening. Mm -hmm. Our own experience here in South Africa is that many protests have become violent, as you know. And that is because people believe it's only when they are violent that the state notices, that the state begins to listen. So I think part of our response as a community is exactly what you say to ensure that we do engage, particularly with young people. And as Jeremy says, find ways to help them overcome or deal with their experience of violence, but also speak truth to power to the leaders who sometimes come with unreasonable uh, restrictions. For example, I know that in South Africa, there are many restrictions and people are starting to feel the pinch, particularly as it relates to their livelihoods. And people are getting really, really frustrated and impatient and the leaders have to listen. They are calling for President Ramaphosa to lift some of these restrictions. But of course, I think they are still prepared to understand why the restrictions are there. So I think communicating with the people and listening is very important. 
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see two other questions and then uh, first we'll, we'll go to Russell and Hezron and then Joe has another question and I think that's probably all we'll have time for. And of course we want to give you the last word, Nazizwe and Jeremy. So let's hear from Russell. What's your question? Russell, are you there? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I was <laughs> muted. So uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, my only previous involvement with the Quakers is through reading literature. So this has been absolutely fascinating today. Um, my question, which I wrote quite imperfectly, in times of pandemic, although the economically privileged have greater means of protecting themselves, truly society can only be safe when everybody can be protected. This is particularly evident in Africa, but it's also important globally. Are the Quakers firstly involved in formally in any interfaith network, just generally to try and imp improve global discussion? And also, is there any involvement in interfaith or otherwise in trying to influence political decision making to improve the way that uh, those in power can help everybody rather than those that just have the greatest means. Um, any details would be welcome. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Why don't you answer it? And then I might give an FWCC perspective. I think, I think you go ahead, uh, Gretchen. Okay. Please. Well, just to say that the Friends World Committee for Consultation, the World Office, we are involved in many, many interfaith uh, conversations and often um, we often uh, sign on to statements that are, uh, you know, we just did one the other day that was to encourage non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. So there are many specific things, often climate issues are very much um, a topic for interfaith discussion. Uh, but we also are involved with the CUNA, with the Quaker United Nations offices in both New York and in Geneva, where, uh, you know, issues are, are addressed and taken on and, and work with actual nation states and, uh, you know, decisions that are made at that uh, top political level. Thank you. You're welcome. Jerry, did you want to say something? Yeah. I think this issue of um, uh, uh, vaccine uh, equality is very important because you need everybody uh, uh, vaccinated, not just uh, the wealthy ones. Yeah, and it is interesting, isn't it, that across many countries, there are sort of the vaccine uh, people that resist that or don't do the masks. And that seems to be happening in many places. It always surprises me, but what do I know? Um, <laughs> Hezron, I wonder if you would ask your question next, please. Thanks, Rachel. I think mine is more of just um, a dilemma that is triggered. We talked about anger. And it just reminds me about the injustice, the kind of state orchestrated injustice uh, needed upon them. Uh, helpless citizens in the name of uh, enforcing uh, lockdowns. People are clobbered, some lost lives, some have been left maimed. I'm just wondering, you know, like this post, or still in the era of you know, COVID and post-COVID, like how do we reconcile that, the level of trauma, I think what people have gone through, I, I don't know any thoughts on that. How, how does one deal with that? In a way, I think has run, uh, you, you are offering an answer because just to start asking ourselves what are people what is making people angry and we also know that there's all of these conspiracy theories around which need to be tackled uh, social media um, and its role can be social media can be quite irresponsible in the kind of communication that happens but i think it's important to start by listening and coming to understand 
what, what the actual issues are and bring this forward to, the, to those in power. If, if you take, for example, a very simple uh, issue that Jeremy brought up, the issue of social distancing and even the washing of hands in, in, a, in a community where it's impossible for people to uh, social distance because they are actually pushed, pushed together from a lack of a, you know, uh, amenities and, and services. So I think it is important for us to act together to bring up th th those issues. And, and with regards to the pandemic, as we all know, in terms of the lockdown, it is mostly those in um, uh, informal employment who have lost their jobs. Yeah. And this needs to be uh, you know, brought, in, um, brought to bear in the kind of relief that is being provided by the state. We have a voice, and I think we must use our voices to bring these matters up. Thank you. Um, Joe, did you have another question that you would like to raise as we begin to wind this session down? Thank you, Gretchen. Um, I just wanted to ask the question around um, your particular thoughts on whether there is a role for the Quaker community globally to facilitate some kind of collective way of processing what is a shared global societal trauma. And the reason I bring this up is because there's a number of groups around the world talking about the notion of post-traumatic growth. In other words, when trauma happens, we can either go into the stress response or as we saw in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was an attempt to begin the work to process the trauma. I'm not going to put anything on a pedestal, but I just wanted to ask the question, because although it's a very different situation, the COVID pandemic has raised the issue of the fact that every person needs some kind of universal basic income. And we've seen huge global volumes of money pushed into vaccinations. So perhaps there's an opening to address what is actually, to your point, Nozis, where the origin of a lot of the, the wrongs and the ills in society around using money in the wrong ways towards false satisfiers for human needs instead of kind of redirecting as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did, which was to bring people into the process of stepping into the new. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that. Thank you. And thank you for the second chance to speak. I think it's a very good question for an FWCC uh, discussion on this, uh, bringing a few experts amongst the Quakers on this issue. But uh, our local meeting has been campaigning for the basic income grant in South Africa. Um, and uh, maybe that's something which is really an infrastructure like anything else, like water, roads, that everybody should have. And perhaps uh, data for, seems to be a similar thing now, which has been heightened during this COVID thing. People who don't have access to the internet are, are left out even more than all those who, who do have access. So it's about what are our basic human needs. Uh, um, one of them would be data and another is an income. And um, we need to really relook at the whole system. But uh, if you've got any answers, uh, that would be great. <laughs> and thank you, Joe. But just in addition to what Jeremy has said, our meeting here in South Africa is beginning to look at the issue of poverty. And we have grinding poverty. Um, in the middle of wealth, in the midst of wealth. As you know, there are some very rich people in our country. So in that process, we are hoping to develop a Quaker statement on ending poverty. Obviously, uh, what, where you start 
with the whole issue of trauma, I think would be very important for us to understand exactly that aspect of it. I know there was a question um, in the chats about dealing with the mental health, dealing with the trauma, and we know how deeply traumatizing uh, this COVID-19 is. And in fact, it has uh, amplified the trauma that people already experience who are unemployed. Here, for example, we know that uh, over 40% officially of uh, South Africans who are meant to be, who are at a employment age are unemployed. And COVID has actually amplified that. So Gretchen, this is a challenge to us, the FWCC yeah. and all our other Quaker structures to pick up this issue as a challenge by Joe. I'm hoping Joe, you will also put down your thoughts and send them through to Gretchen and we can work together on, on this issue over and above other, other issues. And just to close, um, I know that the Quaker Socialist Society is also looking at these issues and going back in our history to look at uh, uh, pamphlets, for example, like the one produced by John Woolman to guide us in our response, especially in relation to economic injustice. So this in fact is um, creating that energy among us to look for solutions. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of this discussion is beginning to guide us, as Jeremy said, toward the World Plenary Meeting in Durban in 2024. I'm looking for good guidance from uh, Southern Africa Yearly Meeting and, and their framing of some of these issues. Both the clerks of that committee are on this call. So um, we're, we're beginning, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the gathering of the Quaker voice, which is what we all do, but, it, but it's what we do at FWCC. And I just wanna say a huge, huge thanks to our Lady of Nations, Nizozwe. It's a, such a lovely image. And indeed, um, I'm about to cry because you've brought such wealth of thought to us and such presence and I think uh, the kinds of questions that people are wanting to ask and talk about, it's all adds to that, to that rich mix. And so let us, let us continue, let us continue to talk and listen and amplify the Quaker voice in the world. Um, I just need to say that uh, our next Quaker conversation will be about climate concerns. And that will be on Saturday, February 27 and that'll be at eight o'clock PM UK time. So we'll, we'll send, you'll, you'll be able to find uh, information about that. This is a free webinar. And so we welcome any financial contributions to FWCC. It would be greatly appreciated. We will send an evaluation at the end of this. And within a week or so, a, a videotape of this conversation will be on our website. You can find it at the FWCC World Office website. So I, I wanna thank you all for coming, for being here, for sharing so richly. Um, and I, two things, I want to just invite Jeremy or Nizozwe to have any kind of final thoughts. And then I thought we might close with just a bit of silence since there's so much here for us to take in and absorb. So Nizozwe, Jeremy, do you have some, some final thoughts you'd like to share? Just one is uh, Johannesburg meeting have their own basic income grant for the meeting. And uh, I think it's been significant and it could be something that other meetings take up. Um, and uh, I think ABP, especially this online, I intend to see if we can't uh, organize one, um, can deal with uh, anger and trauma and a lot of things. It provides a safe space for a lot of things to come up, and that would be very important. I have nothing to add. 
except to echo your words, to thank friends for this rich conversation. Thank you very much. And let us just close with some, some worshipful silence, if we could.
Welcome back, friends. I hope that was uh, enlightening. Ours was amazing. Um,